Let me uh, welcome you all this morning. I'm Roy Blunt. I'm the senator from Missouri. I will say that as a member of the Senate uh, Select Committee on Intelligence, I think I can say without disclosing anything that would be a surprise to anybody, there is no topic we spend more time on than the topic of Iran. Uh, I'd also say as a member of the House and Senate for some time now, I can't think of a time when if you ask where are the two uh, places in the world that you're most concerned about today that Iran wouldn't have been on that list of one of the one or two places in the world uh, most concerned today. Whether we're talking about uh, MEK and, uh, Ka and Camp Ashraf, uh, whether we're talking about uh, people in Iran who have a tremendous desire for uh, freedom and democracy, or of course whether we're talking about uh, Iran as it uh, looks at, uh, at nuclear uh, efforts that uh, many of us uh, believe clearly are headed in, in a bad direction. I think the fact that this uh, great panel would come together this morning and frankly that this room would have uh, this many people and it indicates the, uh, at, at the level of the people that are in this room, indicates the concern and interest uh, and for many families the agony of uh, this ongoing discussion of what can we do uh, to help make uh, this problem better. So uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, Patrick, I'm going to turn uh, the rest of this discussion over to you and this great panel. How is taking on the threat that Tehran poses with the development of a nuclear weapon and what that will do to embolden it to continue to be the largest state-sponsored supporter of terrorism around the world, what that has to do with delisting the main opposition group to the mullahs in Tehran, the MEK, the largest organized effort of any opposition group to the current regime in Iran. Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with that. The fact is, if the United States is to see its interests fulfilled where we see a new day in Iran, where we see a new government in Iran, then it only stands to reason we need to unleash the main opposition to the Tehranian regime, the mullahs in Iran, and that is the MEK. I'm going to start today a little out of order because the government, the Justice Department, the State Department say that there is a potential stumbling block to the U.S. lifting the terror label. And that is that there could be weapons in Camp Ashraf. And so I find this such an insult to our American men and women who stood by and certified to the United States military, to General Odierno, that there weren't any weapons. But I think we should hear from someone who is on the ground, who is in charge and wearing the uniform of the United States military, General Phillips, who was there when Ashraf was de-armed. And I think it's important to hear from him rather than hear from anybody else. I can only imagine how the mullahs laughed as we first the MEK to consolidate at Camp Ashraf, along with other armored vehicles, the artillery pieces, the large arms, the automatic weapons, and the small arms. We did what the Mullah regime could not do. We eliminated the military threat of the Iranian resistance. They, the MEK, voluntarily turned over all of their offensive and defensive weapons, leaving them vulnerable to the insurgents. Yes, there were insurgents in Iraq and infiltrators from the current Iranian regime. Once we had them there, I was showing several of the senior leaders what Camp Ashraf was, because it was an anomaly. It was separate from the rest of what was going on in Iraq. That's probably why they pushed it over to the military police. Let them handle it, they'll handle anything. Well, I took an Air Force uh, general officer around, and he pointed out to me, those look like high-frequency antennas. So we checked and showed what they were. The MEK were broadcasting into Iran. 
I had my falsely speaking language listen in. It was much like the voice of America. The broadcast galores, radio shows, and music. It was a cultural type station. But no, I had to try to shut it down. I had to not only shut it down, I had to seize the equipment so I could not go back on the air. It was unfortunate. Because what the Iranian jammers couldn't do, we did for them. We shut down that voice of hope. And simultaneously, in November of 03, when we supposedly never searched Camp Ashraf in its entirety, we started phase one of an operation. During this phase, we systematically searched every square kilometer of that 36 square kilometer facility simultaneously while we were taking the 3,400 members, including many Iranian Americans. While we were doing that in searching the facility, the NEK loaned us their buses so that we could transport their people off of Camp Ashraf to a facility up north to where we could do biometrics on them. This phase ended on the 13th of January, where we had DNA, retinal scans, and some of the most cutting-edge technology, technological ways of identifying them. Phase two of the operation, which apparently some people don't know ever took place, commenced on the 2nd of March. It was completed on the 4th of May, where each and every member was individually interviewed off of the Camp Ashraf grounds by the FBI and multiple other U.S. agencies, including our intelligence agencies. During this phase, I was physically walking the ground of Camp Ashraf. We offered each member the opportunity to leave. And if they did, there was no eye on them, they could leave. They were provided their, also their personal property and given some funds by the leadership of the NLK. Well, on the 10th of May, 2004, we started the Net Review Board. It concluded on the 4th of June. Yes, I have all these dates because I have all the reports. Each individual was reviewed and an adjudication was made that there were no terrorists, not even wanted criminals among the 3,400 individuals. So the other governmental agencies departed, leaving it to the U.S. Army, specifically a reserve unit out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the 336 MP Battalion that worked for me. I was a commander at 89th MP Brigade. This job was passed from MP unit to MP unit, culminating with the departure of U.S. forces in 2009 from Camp Ashraf. During that time, the military police were proud to report there were no deaths or serious injuries of any member of the MEK. They were turned over to the Iraqis for protection. Their tale is a little bit different. Almost 50 deaths and hundreds wounded. Interesting figures for a protection mission. Okay, anyway, that's not the real focus of what I want to talk about. That's what keeps me up at night. The most troublesome current issue is the factually incorrect assertions made by the government attorney last week at the court hearing on the writ of mandamus. The attorney stated in court that we, referring to the U.S., have never completely searched the entirety of Camp Ashraf, therefore they may still have their means to harm the United States. You ever been in the middle of the Isle? It is a long way from the middle of the United States. Also, he added that the NEK never gave us open access to the entire camp. I take great offense to those comments because of the dedication and hard work done over a year long period from 2003 to the end of 2004, when my forces conducted operations, inspections, raids to find any contraband, looking for weapons, explosives, other elements, possibly hidden someplace on this facility and around the facility. We didn't stay confined to the facility. First, we had open access everywhere, at any time, any place. Look at it. If somebody would have prevented us access, it would have been a very bad day for them. 
We all sorted ourselves. We chose locations and went to them. No place was off limits. And the reason that we never had an altercation is because no doors were closed or locked to us. We went where we wanted to go. We saw what we wanted to see. Now for the tools assertion that there may be still uh, weapons hidden someplace on the camp because we've never fully searched because it's a big area. To that I say, we really don't search. I personally was to every single facility on that 36 square kilometer facility. This is my area of photography that has every building and it is a detailed shop to where I could even see tracks in the dirt when I would blow it up. So if there was any level of the ground, we would inspect it to make sure weapons had not been buried there the night before. I went to the morgue, inspected there, to the hospitals, to the trains. Every place was inspected on that camp. There's also an assertion that the camp's not fenced in. I don't know, could have fooled me. It's a 12-foot fence all the way around, six kilometers by six kilometers. Castle Tanner went up on top. Sounds like a fence to me. We used high-tech methods looking for weapons. And we used some good old-fashioned boots on the ground. We did find bayonets. And female boots in their wall lockers next to their personal clothing was a bayonet. I let them keep the bayonets. We did clear thousands of deadly bayonets. We demilitarized over a hundred bunkers filled with ammunition and thoroughly checked every square meter of the 36 square kilometer facility. I don't read a report about this. I don't look at any intel action about it. I did it. I walked the ground. I went to the facilities. I inspected every other structure on the camp. It's not hearsay. First hand, I was there. I can tell you where rock was unturned. We did have open access to the entire of that camp, and never did we find a single weapon. Now there's another side to this, too. I wanted to find weapons. Remember? I'm a soldier. I was given a mission to guard 3,400 de uh, detainees who were terrorists. I believed they were terrorists when I took over that mission. So by God, I was going to find a smoking gun. I was going to prove why we were in the middle of the Isle of Desert in 45 degrees Celsius. And it, uh, it's pretty hot over there in the summer looking for contraband. Soldiers have a unique perspective on the world. Now, if you listen to it, it's amazing what you can learn. In my case, I traveled with a 12 soldier security detail of four up armored Humvees. We traveled the entire country, we did an Iraqi police, keeping the high value detailers, and yes, guarding Saddam Hussein. That was our job. We had another job of detailing and protecting the 3,400 people at Camp Ashraf. When my soldiers would ask, more subtly, Sir, when are we going back to Ashraf? You know why they ask that? Because on Ashraf, in the midst of 3,400 terrorists, they felt safe. In fact, it was the safest place my soldiers were in that country. I walked, talked, spent time with, usually unarmed, with the so-called hardcore, the government of China is trying to mind, hardcore members of the MEK. I don't call them hardcore members. I know them, the people. Few people know these hardcore members better than me. So did they have weapons hidden on Camp Ashraf? No. And think about it. I staked my life on it. Ashraf was the safest place in Iraq. Thank you.